On this episode of Building Men, prioritizing awareness and optimizing your health with Alvi Thompson. Alvi is a holistic life coach who helps men and women get in the best shape of their lives physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. His vision is creating a world that's healthy, connected, creative, purposeful, and loving. His work includes one-on-one and group coaching with an emphasis on helping his clients get clarity on where they want to go in life, where they currently are, and that builds a custom program that teaches them tools, habits, and routines to fill the gap. Alvi's Instagram handle is Mr. You Can Too. And you know what I keep telling myself over and over again after having a conversation with Alvi? You can do it! You can do it! You can do it! You can do it! You can do it. You can do it! 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 Welcome to the Building Men Podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Meralda. Hello everyone and welcome to the Building Men Podcast. My name is Dennis Meralda, and Building Men is geared toward helping you become the strongest version of yourself mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. That's been the tagline of Building Men since I started, and it was recently I started to think about, should I choose, like change up the tagline as I start getting going? Is that you know a little bit redundant? And then I found the gentleman that I'm, that I'm going to be speaking to today, and it's one thing that he speaks about as well. Alvy Thompson is a holistic life coach, and in my you know journey in building men, I found him, and he talks about you know helping people spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And I'm like, this is a guy I need to connect with. I need to, to talk to this man. He also runs the Instagram page, Mister You Can Too, with the number two, and that's where I've been following along on his journey. So, Alvy, welcome to the Building Men Podcast, my man. Hey, Dennis, appreciate you having me, man. Really excited to be here. Yeah, my pleasure. I got to start off first with. One thing that I noticed on your journey watching you on Instagram, your hair is on point. How long does that take to get your hair in that way? It's it's tremendous. Oh, man. It's been quite the hair journey. I feel like I've been growing my hair out now for like, I don't even know. I probably cut it maybe like four years ago is the last time I cut it. But I have uh, some great women in my life who style it up real nice. And really, all I got to do is wake up, put it in a nice uh, hair tie and a bun, and I'm good to go. So... Shout out to those ladies. Oh, yeah. And it's a lot that you can do with your hair, too. I mean, I feel with, with me, I just, I don't I don't think I would ever look good with long hair. And I, <laughs> it's all, it's getting long on the sides. And then I'm starting to get a little bit of that warm spot in the back. My kids tell me all the time, they're like, Dad, you got to watch it. You know, you got to put on the suntan lotion because you're, that little warm spot in the back of your head is starting to get burned. Oh, no, that's so funny. Listen, yeah, they'll man. take every opportunity they can to cut me down. And it's fine. It's what kids are for. Keep you on the toes, I bet. Absolutely. So, Alvy, yeah. tell me a little bit about, well, I'll start with the Mr. You Can Too Instagram page. Tell me what you do on that page first, because I'm interested in that. Yeah, my whole idea behind my Instagram page is really to inform, educate, and inspire. So, You Can Too, that's my business. I'm the founder of You Can Too. And it's really a mindset and a belief. And I want people to understand that anything that somebody is doing out there, if he or she can do it, you can too. And let other people's stories, triumph situations, be a catalyst and an inspiration for the person looking at it to be like, hey, like that's very similar to what I want to do. I know I can also achieve that because it's being done. Have you ever seen the movie The Edge with Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin? I haven't. I haven't. Right. It's it's a it's an older movie. It was it was in the nineties. And basically, Alec Baldwin and Anthony Hopkins get stranded out in the wilderness in Alaska. They were there for a photo shoot, and they get stranded out there. No one knows that they were still alive. There was a little plane crash, and there's a Kodiak bear that's hunting them. And basically, they're trying to survive without any you know, survival tools or anything, just based on their own wits. And Anthony Hopkins says to Alec Baldwin, like, there's been a time in, our, in the world, history of the world that a man has killed a bear. And he goes, one man has killed a bear. And he said, what one man can do, another can do. Repeat after me, what one man can do, another can do. And that, what you just said, struck a chord with me. Because if there's someone out there that is doing whatever, they pull themselves up out of a difficult situation, they're doing something physically, emotionally, spiritually, if one person can do it, if you 
invest in that, another person can do it. So that's a, that's a great message that they have right here. So now I'm interested in how did you get to that point where you're delivering that message? Everybody that I'm talking to has gone through this hero's journey, that they've gone through a point where they found themselves in a spot where they're looking in the mirror trying to figure out, how did I get here? Do I want to continue? And if I do, what are the, what are the steps I'm going to take? So they're finding themselves in this really challenging spot. So I'll be start with maybe start in your experience in school, any pick any place you want along, along your journey in school where maybe there were a couple circumstances or instances that happened that led you to a, a, a point in your life where you were like, okay, now what's next? Yeah, for sure. It's a great question. And when I look back to my education, a big part was my transition from high school to college. So I had been an athlete my entire life and I was a captain of the football team when I was in high school and then I was transitioning over to play football at Georgetown University. And you know, as a freshman, you're the lowest person on the totem pole. You kind of earn your way up through your play and how you show up. And it was so interesting for me because I got to this point where I realized that it's not so much just about what I do on the field, but it's also like, how do I carry myself and how do I handle adversity within the football program? So up to that point, I always thought, hey, the better I play, the better I perform, you know, the more playing time I'm gonna get. And it wasn't until I got to Georgetown and I realized that it wasn't just the way that I played, but there was other things going on in the background. And that's the first time I really learned the lesson of control what I could control. And unfortunately, looking back in hindsight, I didn't have that skill set when I first got there or even through the first couple of years of my career. And what I found myself doing was getting really upset around decisions that coaches were making, where I was getting really upset on how the coaches might have been treating other players in comparison to myself. And in reality, the only thing I could really control was how was I showing up for practice and games and ultimately handling my business, yet I was so caught up in all of those other things that it actually impacted the way that I practiced and played. Yeah. And now I gave the coaches an actual reason not to play me. And it wasn't until after I graduated college that I realized how powerful the idea of control what you can control really is. So let me let me go back a little bit. I'm I'm really interested, and I'm I'm so happy you brought that up. I didn't I didn't realize um, that there was that part of it with playing football at Georgetown. I'm so interested in that now. What position did you play in, in high school and college? Yeah, so I was a defensive lineman, so defensive tackle and defensive end. So what? skills do you think you need as to be really successful as a defensive lineman? What are the physical skills that you need? What are the emotional skills and the mental skills you need to be successful as a defensive lineman? Yeah, so the first thing I would say is playing with leverage, right? And in football, we have this saying, the low man wins. So understanding how to use your body, leverage your body. And then secondly, your hand placement, how well you can use your hands, shed blocks, absorb blocks, get off of blocks, all of those good things. And then from a mental aspect, it's really understanding one play at a time. Focus on my job, like where's the gap that I need to be? What is this play asking me to do? And how can I do that at the highest ability that I can and literally focus on what I can control for my job versus trying to do the person's job next to me or try to make some hero play where if I mess up, I actually put somebody on my team in a bad situation. So those were, were some of the biggest lessons I learned as a defensive lineman. So I didn't, again, I, we didn't talk about this at all beforehand. And I'm so, I'm so happy we're going down this journey right now. It hasn't been something that, I, that I've ever addressed on Building Men. So I'm actually working in collaboration with a gentleman who is a scout for a professional football team. Nice. And we're working to try to develop a program around the, how the mindset and then the athleticism impacts the performance on the field. And as a scout for a professional football team, he's basically charged with interviewing any prospective draft pick for this team. And what he's asked to do is really look back, not only at their, their physical gifts, he gets into, he's, he has a doctor of psychology. So he gets into the mental aspect around the position that they're playing. And when he's looking for, say an offensive lineman, he wants them to have some kind of a background in engineering. They need to have, like that needs to be their, their focus in education and engineering. 
he hopes that they have worked on a farm at some point in their life or had have an opportunity to kind of understand things at that level and, and even with their strength. For linebackers, he needs to understand that they've had a physical altercation with someone in their life. Mm-hmm. Like they believe it or not, this is what they do as scouts, is they really want to see that they have had they've been aggressive in a physical altercation. They want them to have been suspended from school for getting into a fight because that shows that they have that mentality of like a like a pit bull coming into a situation. And then the crazy thing is, Alvi, is th- there's such a deep dive into even being a running back. Like if you're a running back, you know every time that you get the rock, there's going to be pain inflicted on you. But you want that. So there has to be some kind of a situation in your life as an athlete that you want to experience pain. And on this journey that I've gone on, there's been a guy that we're working with collaboratively that he was a running back in in high school and in college. And he was like, we asked him, why did you want to be a running back? And he said, because I like to get hit. And we're like, in football, that's usually you like to hit other people. It's not that you like to get hit. And he goes, well, it's because I know that no one could ever hit me harder than my dad did. And it was wow. like, whoa, yeah, it went deep. to this deep dive. So now uh, the fact that you were mentioning, you know, the, the thing around the physical aspect, the mental aspect, do you think that there's any like deeper social, emotional reason that maybe that was a position that you gravitated towards? Or it's because you're, you know, a big athletic dude who can run quick and, and is really strong? Or do, or do you think that yeah. there's a deeper part to it? Man, that's such, a, that's such an interesting question. I've never been asked that before, but the first thing that comes up for me is, man, there, there's really nothing like getting a sack in football for me. So it's like, you think about football, the most important player in the game is the quarterback, hands down. Like they get all the blame, they get all the glory. Essentially, it's always coming down to them. And as a defensive lineman, like you're trying to, to take that quarterback out. Like you're trying yeah. to make plays on him. You're trying to make sure he can't be successful. And then right behind that, you got, you know, the running back is usually the second most, at least highly counted or like most athletic person on the field, especially when you're young, like the high school ranks, right? So for me, it's like I always wanted to take those people out. Like yeah. I always wanted to go against the best. Right. I always want to be putting myself in a position where, you know, you can literally put a wall of men in front of me and I'm not going to let that wall stop me from getting to what I want to get to in the quarterback. And I think that's definitely carried over into my regular everyday life as well, where there's, you know, incredible goals that I have for myself. And there's literally no shortage of adversity or things blocking me from trying to obtain that goal. And at the end of the day, it's like I have my eyes on the goal. I don't care what these things are because I already proved to myself that I can get past those things to actually get after what I want, whether it's a specific goal of achieving something great in my business or taking the quarterback out. And when you think about the defensive lineman position, you just you have to just keep going forward. You have you just keep pushing forward. That's one of those positions where you know every other position. You know, offensive linemen they're they're backing up on their feet at some points. Some points they're pushing forward. Mm-hmm. The quarterback might be you know rolling, but the 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 defensive linemen like they are pushing forward. They might not be able to see the quarterback in front of, them, but they can smell them. They know that they're there, For and sure. th- that makes sense to me. So that that's why I was just interested in that deeper psychological experience. Uh, playing defensive lineman. The next thing I'm thinking about is just the the team aspect. So I played um, high school and college college sports as well, and there's something to that camaraderie aspect. And in the Building Men program, I've noticed the value and, and really seen the value of connections and relationships more than most things. It's such an important part of life is just feeling connected to other human beings in a deep way. So as you're playing college sports, one, how did that? How did it work in a, in a Division One college football locker room? How did you see the, those interactions between your your teammates? Was it the D line was like we are thick as thieves, we are together, we're going to do everything together? Was it the defense that hung out together all the time because you were a unit on one side of the ball, or did it kind of you know you just had your boys here and there and it, it didn't matter? Yeah, my experience at Georgetown, we had all different types of um, relationships throughout the team. So like me personally, when I think about, you know, Georgetown, the student population is probably 10% black people, right? And then when I look at the football team in total, it was probably like 35, 40%. So naturally when people come in and they don't 
know anybody, you typically gravitate towards the people that look like you, right, first and foremost. So I had a lot of bonds that started out that way um, through the football team of people who play all different positions, but just as black men, we all gravitated together and we hung out a lot. So that was one part of it. Another part of it was just having different guys on the defense that we all hung out together because, yeah. you know, when you're on a team and then you talk about football, it's like you have, you know, little subunits within the team, just like in a business, right? In a school, whatever it may be. And I found myself always hanging out with the people that I was spending a lot of time on the field with. So it would be a couple of my buddies who were either defensive linemen or they were linebackers, defensive backs. You know, we're always in the defensive meetings together. And then even right. closer than that, we're in the defensive line meetings together. So when you're spending that much time with somebody within football, you know, naturally you're going to spend time with those people, you know, outside of the field too. So I would say most of the friendships in there were based off of, you know, position groups first, but then also too, like you might get roomed with just a teammate from a different position, but you guys are roommates. And now because of that, you're kind of cross hanging out with other positions as well. So very random, very different for everybody. But for me, it was first like the other black players on the team. And then from there, it was a lot of the position players, whether it's defensive line first or defense as a whole. So I'm going to bring it to the uh, the racial thing first and then back to the football thing. It's so interesting. My first year as an assistant principal, Albie, I remember standing in the cafeteria and I was with two teachers. I was a teacher and a guidance counselor. And the one teacher on my right hand side, I could re I could recall this like it happened yesterday, said to me, why do all the black kids sit together in the cafeteria? And I I kind of took a step back and I looked over at him and the guidance counselor who I was next to this old wise woman her name was betty van and she, I, she was just to me was just this unbelievable human being and she just saw things in a different in a different way she was like the old wise owl that just spoke mm -hmm. in a different way so she goes why do all the white kids sit together why don't you look at about it why don't you look at it that way why did you why did you why did you pick out why do all the black kids sit together look at it why do all the white kids sit together obviously they have you know something that makes them connect because of their skin color but then they have shared experience that maybe they've gone through in that but then what can we do to you know one honor that absolutely why would you say black kids shouldn't be sitting together or white kids shouldn't be sitting together but let's then break down why we think about that why did right. our minds automatically go to that and it was a deep dive it was my first year as an assistant principal i was 28 and i was like wow this is a this is deeper than i thought it was going to be i mm. never really considered it in that way so it, I'm, I'm so happy that you brought that up because it makes us challenge our own thinking in a different way and that's the only way we grow is when we challenge our thinking and our preconceived notions 100 the second thing i'm interested in knowing is so now you're a you know a college athlete at a, at a, a big time D1 school, and obviously there were lessons that you learned from your coaches that helped you in your future become what you are today. But there were probably other things that you learned along the journey that you're like, you know what, when I'm, you know, in front of people, I'm leading people, I would never ever do that. So what's a lesson that you learned oh, from yeah. a coach that was like, I need to be this way, I need to emulate this, and then what's a lesson that you learned from your coach that you said, no way in hell I'm going to do that when I'm coaching people. Wow, great question. So the first one I would say in regards to what I heard a coach say that I didn't agree with at the time, and I, I alluded to this earlier, but I, I hold it so dearly now, is this idea of controlling what you can control. I remember my defensive coordinator, uh, Coach Scarlotta, who's now the head coach at Georgetown, speaking on that. And because I was so jaded, because I was just looking at things and being like, oh, no, like, you, you, you guys are just saying that to kind of, you know, make yourselves look good. Like that doesn't really apply to me in real life and what's going on. And it was one of these situations where, you know, I couldn't see the forest from the trees. So I couldn't really bring in that lesson as powerful as it was then. But when I look back at it now, it's something that I live by every single day because I realized that at the end of the day, the only thing I can control is how I interact with my thoughts, the words that I use and the actions that I take. And anything that's outside of that is literally out of my control. Right. And I've realized how precious my energy and my peace is. And when I realize that I can use my energy and solely focus that on the things that I control, that's when I get huge results. And that's when I, I experience a lot of fulfillment in my life versus how I felt in college and even a little bit after college 
you know, there were so many things that I tried to force and make happen that were completely out of my hands that actually had me take steps back in life, right? And actually had me not create the things that I wanted and even hurt a lot of relationships that I had. So understanding how important it is to control what I can control is, that's the one that I really take away from one of the coaches. And then one that I received that I just was just like, nah, that's not gonna be me, is really the way how the head coach at the time, in my perception, just was never really able to really like meet a person where they're at, right? It was like this whole idea of, you know, not being able to confront somebody in such a way that allows that person to get it, right? So what I mean by that is, say a player does something that the coach didn't like, it's essentially, you know, the coach would just go in and just like rip the player a new one, as opposed to first asking the player like, hey, what happened? What had you get into this situation? Like really try to build up some context of like, you know, what was the player's perspective on it? How can the player grow from it? And instead it's just like, yo, I'm gonna reprimand you. I'm going to yell at you. And if you don't do it this way, then like you're done, right? You're out of here. And the way that I look at that now and how I try to really do the opposite is truly understanding where a person is coming from. And even if I don't agree with somebody, it's like, let me ask enough questions and let me actually actively listen to understand right. to see where that person is coming from and why it is that they think the things that they do or why is it that they might have done some of the things that they do so that together we can collaborate on a better alternative or a better solution going forward as opposed to me just saying like, you know what, forget this person, like I'm cutting them out of my life, they're no good, I'm gonna keep it moving. Right. I appreciate what you said about the positive message you heard from your coach. At the time, you didn't recognize that it was this powerful message. You just felt like, okay, this is in the Coach Speak Handbook 101 on page four. He needs to just say, don't worry about things that are not in your control. Control what you can control. But it's such a deep thing, especially that as you got later on in your adult life, you understood it on a deeper level. And it almost speaks to me about the difference between a the positive speak and the victim mindset speak that people have, especially when you are putting other people in control of your destiny. I, you know, I can't do this because of the way my, I was raised by my dad or she has, she's controlling me in my relationship. You're, you're giving that power to another human being. You have to take back and look at it. I am in control of my thoughts, my emotions, my actions, my character, my destiny. It's all within my control. So right. you took that from that coach and, and turned it into something that now you're helping other people. The second, the, the lesson that you learned from the coach of what not to do, I'll, I'll weave it back towards the end because I, I have a, you know, I have a thought about that, but I wanted to take it to the spot in your, in your hero's journey. You mentioned, and I believe it was 2015 that you said, I, I watched a video clip of you. It was a really emotional video clip. And as I stopped through, I, I, I was, as I was scrolling through, I stopped on that and I watched it and then I watched it again. And then I watched it again because it had such a pervasive and powerful impact on me and, and your level of authenticity and transparency telling this story. And you said your rock, the person that you got the most out of in your life that really kind of helped you become the man that you are today was your mother. And talk to us a little bit about that post that you put up and, and the message behind that post, Albie. Yeah, hundred percent. I appreciate you taking the time to watch it. So my mom passed away in 2015 and 2015 was four years after I had graduated from college. So when I look at my relationship with my mom, you know, from when I was born up until I got to college, like super strong relationship, like absolutely adored her, super grateful for all the things that, that she had done for me and just single mother just did it all right for my brother and myself and then once i came back from college and now I'm, I'm 22 years old now i had lived an entire life you know four years as an adult i had been on my own and i also learned about what it meant for me to you know be a man and take care of myself and provide for myself so when i moved back i had a lot of turmoil within myself because 
on one side, I wanted to be my own man and provide for myself. And I was telling myself all these crazy stories about what it meant about me to graduate from college and move back home, as opposed to be living on my own and you know doing all the things I thought I was supposed to be doing at the right. time. And then balancing that against my mom, who still wanted to provide and do everything for me from the aspect of like cook for me, clean after me, and then also like, you know, want to know where I was when I was out, wanted me to check in, do all of these things. And for me, I was really annoyed by it. Like in my head, the way I looked at it, it's like, man, my mom's trying to baby me where in hindsight and in reality, I realized that was my mom being a mom, right? Yeah. Always going to worry about her kids and want to do all these things. And the second thing was, I also could see now how much my mom was self-sabotaging herself, right? So my mom growing up had all the Western lifestyle diseases. She was type two diabetic. She was obese, high blood pressure, heart disease, addicted to her opioid medications, fixed mindset, victim mentality, all of these things. And when I was young, I didn't realize any of this or like, I didn't realize the toll this was having on her. But now as I moved back and as an adult, I could see just how sick she was. Right. And for me, I saw my mom trying to provide and give me all those things, yet she wasn't giving to herself. And as I was going through my journey of adulthood and I became a sports performance coach, a personal trainer, and a nutrition coach, I started to learn all of these practices and tools that was allowing my clients to have such amazing results. And for me, I was like, I have to have my mom do these things. Like, mom, you have to move this way. You have to eat this way. And at the same time, like, don't do anything for me unless you're doing it for yourself. And that caused so much tension between her and I. Because one, I was never meeting her where she was at. It was all rooted in like, hey, you have to do this. You have to do that. And if you don't, then I'm going to withhold my love from you. And I didn't realize consciously that that's what I was doing. But as I look back at the situation, that's exactly what I was doing. And eventually it got to this point where because my mom never filled up her own cup, she was always seeking external validation. And she was, she was just not confident about the way that she looked. And years before she had gotten gastric bypass surgery where they staple your stomach, your stomach becomes smaller, you can only eat so much food. So because of that, you're gonna end up losing weight. So my mom over the years lost weight, but then she had this ex excess skin that she was just so self-conscious about. Yeah. And in her head, she thought that if she was to get rid of this excess skin, now she will be confident and now she'll really accept herself and her body. Um, but the thing was, my mom wasn't a healthy enough candidate for that type of surgery. So she kept going to different doctors, trying to find one who could do the surgery for her. And all of them basically said like, hey, Vicky, you're not healthy enough. I can't approve this. My mom was the type of person who wouldn't really take no for an answer. So she actually kept searching until she found a doctor that said, hey, Vicky, you have a hernia. And in order for me to repair the hernia, I'm gonna have to remove all of the excess skin around your stomach. And that's what my mom was looking for. Yeah, that's it. That's what she needed. Yeah. That was the one thing she needed. That's what she thought was going to change her life. And literally the day before she had the surgery, she was having second thoughts about it. I was hanging out with her at her house. She shared that with me. And I was like, Mom, don't worry. You don't need it. Like, we'll figure this out. I'll help you with it. And then at the end, she said, like, no, no, I'm still going to, you know, think about it. I'm still going to go ahead and get it. And that led to her and I getting into a huge argument. And unfortunately, that argument was literally the last conversation that I ever had with my mom. And, you know, she went in for the surgery, um, eventually got out of the surgery and complained to feel a little bit out of breath. And shortly after that, she went to this episode where she couldn't breathe. So the hospital induced her into a coma and transferred her to another hospital. And over the span of 12 weeks, she just never came out of it. And it was one of these situations where, man, I had, I had so much anger, frustration, sadness, guilt towards myself, towards my mom, towards, you know, 
the doctor, the system, all of this stuff. And it wasn't until, you know, a few months after she had passed away where I realized like, you know, we talk about this looking in the mirror moment. You know, I'm looking at myself and I realized like, man, there's a skill set that I'm really missing right now because how is it that I have all of these tools around health and wellness, but I couldn't help my mom with those things. And I realized what was missing was this ability to truly meet somebody where they're at, right? And I thought to myself, well, if I had this, these skills to actually actively listen, lead with compassion, and hold that level of space, well, maybe my mom would be alive today. And that's what inspired me to get into life coaching. And I took a life coaching certification through the Human Potential Institute. And it was amazing. It was one of those spaces where, yes, I learned all of these skills around active listening, you know, leading with compassion, meeting somebody where they're at. But more important than that, Dennis, it actually gave me my first opportunity to be open and vulnerable with somebody else. See, up until that time, I was really the only person in my circle who was very much into, you know, eating a certain way, into, you know, personal development and growing and all these types of things. And because of that, I felt very alone. So whenever there was something that I needed help with, I didn't really feel like I had anybody that I could turn to and that I trusted to be open with. And the way that this coaching certification I took worked was that every week after we learned some type of competency, we would coach each other. And it was during those moments that I realized with my cohort, like, hey, I'm around a bunch of men and women who are of the same mindset as me that are trying to grow and develop themselves and are also looking to help others in a variety of ways. Like, these are my people I can open up. And literally by talking about my story, talking about my relationship with my mom, my mom's death, just all of the limited beliefs that I had at the time, all of my ineffective habits and really asking for feedback and, and ways to improve. Like, man, that, that was some of the biggest healing I had ever had in my life up to that point. And that's what showed me how powerful, one, being open and vulnerable can be, and two, the power of coaching and being able to be in a space where I feel like I can be heard, I can be understood, where I'm going to get feedback that's ultimately going to help me live my best life. And man, it was just such an amazing experience. And that's what really changed the way that I started doing my work and how I interacted with people. Because, you know, up until that time, like my company is, is called You Can Too. We talk about the mindset and the belief that that is. The way I originally got that name is because I heard my mom say, I can't so often. Oh, I can't eat like that. Oh, I, I can't go for a walk. Yeah. Oh, I can't change this. I can't change that. And it was funny, man. I remember thinking like, you know, it doesn't matter how many men and women I help, it's not gonna matter because I couldn't help my mom. And it was through that level of coaching and having you know a couple of different plant medicine ceremonies and just different you know spiritual experiences where I started to realize that, you know, I get all of my love for service and giving from my mom. But what I also get from my mom and through her death is this understanding that I can only give from what's overflowing from my cup. And it's so important to make sure that I'm filling my cup at a high level so that I have the energy and the resources to truly give to others. I appreciate you taking us down that path. There's a, it's, it's an emotional experience. I'm sure there were a lot of people listening that got a little choked up during that, um, you know, answer that you gave right there. To me, the excess skin on your mom's body, it, that wasn't it. That that represented just, you know, a hole that she had in her heart that she wasn't able to fill because she right. wasn't taking care of herself first. It right. was that, that extrinsic motivation, that extrinsic value that she was placing on things. And people think it's selfish when I tell them, you need to make sure that you're good with you first. That your relationship right. with yourself has to be the most important relationship in your life because unless, like you mentioned, just that the visual of unless your cup is over overfilled over you know overflowing you're not truly able to give the best of you to help someone else that's dealing with something challenging 100 
I think about, and I've mentioned it before in different interviews, the idea of the last time. We have, you know, you remember your first sack in college. Oh, you sure. remember, you know, your first time behind the wheel. You probably remember the first time you kissed a girl. Things like that. Th- those are situations that you remember in your life. But there's not a ceremonial thing about the last time. Going into a last time, you don't know that that's going to be the last time. Mm. That something occurs in your life. I, I think about, you know, as I was getting on today, I said, my, my youngest, and I'll get choked up now, my, my youngest, it was their last day of elementary school. So they do this big ceremony where they clap the kids out. They're, they're coming out of elementary school. They clap the kids out. And um, at the moment, I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is such an unbelievable experience, this and that. She ran up to me in tears, crying, hugs me. And I was thinking, is this the last time that my little girl is going to run out of school and hug me? Could, could that be the last time? And mm. I was like, let me, let me fully soak in this moment right now, understanding it might be the last time, but it's, it's so hard to identify those moments that could potentially be the last time something happens. So we need to lean into all the moments that we're having, all these different experiences that we're having, thinking this could be the last time that I speak to this person, that I play catch with my son, that, whatever it is. Absolutely. So this will be a, a deep emotional dive here. If you had, if you knew, Alvi, that that day before was the last time you had an opportunity to say something to your mom, what would you, what would mm-hmm. you tell her? What would your conversation be like if you knew it was the last time? Oh man, I would have, man, just expressed to her how much I love her, how much I thank her for everything that she did for me and for my brother, and for literally, like putting her health to the side to to make sure that we were okay, and. I would have apologized for being such an asshole those last those last three to four years. And, and it's crazy that, that you asked this question because I had a moment where I was in the hospital with my mom when she was on her deathbed and she was in, you know, she's, she's in this coma. So like, you know, she's hooked up to the breathing machines, has all the wires, all these things. And, you know, even when you look at her eyes, like you could tell she's not there. But I had this one moment where I visited her maybe six, seven weeks in where I felt like she was really there and like we're able to make eye contact and I felt like there was something there. And man, that's when I had that moment where I was bawling, crying, I was apologizing for everything. I was telling her how sorry I was and how much I love her and how beautiful she is and how perfect she is to me already. And that, you know, she doesn't have to change anything. If she doesn't want to change anything, I'm going to be here to support her and love her unconditionally. And, um, man, that, that's the most and the hardest I've ever cried in my life, um, up to this day. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful point that you make that, you know, we never know when the last moment is going to be. So how can we be present in everything that we're doing with ourselves and, and with others and truly enjoy and appreciate those moments so that there aren't any regrets? God forbid something does happen to, you know, ourselves or to that person that we're enjoying that moment with. You mentioned the lessons that you learned from your mom, Alvi, and, and thank you for sharing that story as well. And I know it, it, it's a difficult question to answer. And I told you before, I don't script any questions. I just go uh, off of our conversation. But as you started that. talking about th- that journey you had after you went through that, you understood for you to truly experience and be the best you can you that you were able to be. You needed to be vulnerable enough to kind of and one forgive yourself for that yeah. and then to be vulnerable to share your story with other people so i guess that experience that you went through with your mom that's a, a lesson around masculinity that you learned about being vulnerable yeah. talk to us a little bit about you know maybe another lesson or two that you learned that helped shape the man you are today so how did how did you define what masculinity means based on another lesson or two in your life yeah, for sure. I mean, I would say a big one that comes up for me in regards to masculinity is being fully expressed. Like I think of men, like what does it mean to be a dynamic man? And when I say that we're dynamic, like there's so many aspects of our being. There's so many different ways that we can show up as a, as a lover, as a friend, as a father, as a son, as an everything. And I've realized how important it is to be able to say whatever it is that we truly want to say that's on our heart, how important it is to 
you know, dress the way that we want to dress, to, you know, wear our hair however we want to wear our hair, to essentially live life by the ways that we truly internally think are important versus what other people's definition of masculinity or being a man looks like. So for me, like, to wrap that up in one word, it, it's, it's authenticity, right? With some full self-expression and integrity all mixed in. I think all of those are, are super important to me as a man. And I understand that when I'm living in accordance to my values and my principles, I am being a dynamic man. I am being the best version of myself possible. And I know that's what's working for me. And it might be different for you. It might be different for the man next to me. And all of that is perfectly fine, right? Because we all get to coexist and be able to get along no matter if our definitions of things look different. You mentioned before, Alvi, that the and I'll I'll take from that answer the authenticity on my journey in building men I'm slowly developing my definition of it and the word dynamic is such an unbelievable word it has such passion and power and there's such action with that word I just I absolutely love that word it's gonna I'm gonna wrap that into my definition in some way shape or form that word dynamic I love you that. mentioned your coach at Georgetown. And you said one of the, the faults that you, you would identify was that he was unable to meet the players where they are. Right. As a former principal, I would talk to teachers around, it can't be, we can't treat kids like they come out of a cookie cutter mold, that every one of them are exactly the same. Every single person is different. It's a snowflake. It's, it's the idea where we're, we're all learning differently. We all have our sim, you know, uh, different challenges, experiences that we've gone through in life that shape who we are. But the way that we learn is very different. So if we're trying to, you know, the, the age old thing is a square peg in a round hole. If we're trying to do that as educators, we're making a mistake. We need to be able to differentiate the way that we are communicating with the students. I believe that coaches need to be able to differentiate their coaching to meet the needs of the players in front of them. The way that, you know, a 6'5", 280 pound D lineman, the way, you know, that might have, you know, emotional issues with around something. We need to talk to them a little bit different than someone who, whose father was incarcerated or someone who has, um, you know, mental health issues in another spot. We can't just say, okay, it's my program. This is, everyone is going to be treated the, exactly the same way. While there are certain things like, all right, we need to show up 10 minutes early. You need to give 110%. We need to take care of the team first. But individually, we need to take care of each one of those people in the, the interactions and the relationships that we're building with them individually. So that idea of meeting the person where they are. So the, the lesson that you learned from your coach was, all right, I need to be able to do that. So now you take this lesson, I'm going to be able to do that. Tell me how that works with your holistic coaching. How do you, how do you go ahead and meet people where they are? Tell me about how you do that. Yeah, I mean, the first part is through gaining awareness and clarity. So I work with my clients to really uncover and unpack where is it that they currently are in their life right now? And then also where is it that they want to go? And once we're clear on those two things, like now we can put together all the different tools, routines, systems, tactics, ideas into how to fill that gap. And one of my favorite quotes that I've ever heard, I forget who the author of this quote is, but it's this idea that if you don't have a destination, any road will take you there, right? So it's so important for each and every single person that I work with to be extremely clear on where is it that you want to go? And once you know where that place is, why is it important? How is it going to change your life? How will you start experiencing life once you are moving in that direction? Because once we have that North Star, we can use that as a filter to make decisions and understand when something is like an easy yes and when something's like a hell no, like definitely not do that because it's not in alignment with what it is that I truly desire. And then also within that, it's understanding like what are the things getting in the way, right? Whether it's showing up in the term in the ways of external validation, trying to keep up with the Joneses, the comparison, these ideas of where you think you should be based on how someone else is like this, you know, what are the things that you're doing that are holding you small and what can we co-create together 
that's going to help you eliminate that thing or those things so that we can actually add these other things into your life that are going to allow you to get to where you want to go. There's, there's the thought of like designing like forward, like front, like, all right, I'm going to design my life in this way, this step, this step, this step. You're talking about a backwards design. You're talking about like starting at the end point. I need to start with my goal and then let me like visualize these incremental steps I need to, to get to my goal. So it's a, it's a perfect analogy. You know, if you don't know where your destination is, I could turn left, turn right. It doesn't freaking matter because right. I don't know where I'm going anyway. So I love the way that you're able to describe that, you know, where you're, you're starting with that end goal and designing backwards from that point. The last thing I wanted to ask you, because it pops up all the time on Instagram, is the the power walking. You're yeah. you're power you're 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 an, an avid power walker, and I see I'm like, what the hell is this guy doing? Uh-huh. Like, you're 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 going, you're talking, you're motivating, you're to so talk to us a little bit about that process. How did you get into it, and like a little bit about what it is what it's about? Yeah, man, the speed walking. It's so funny. So that started literally like beginning of the pandemic. Like there were gyms weren't open. Even the park that my fiance and I used to go to, like that was closed. So literally all we had was this sidewalk and we we're just walking, like kind of like messing around. And, you know, she started walking fast and I was like, oh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk fast, like faster, faster. Yeah. And, you know, we started having fun with it. And then I just had her to start recording it. I was like, yeah, let's get like the speed walking really going. Yeah. And it ended up being a lot of fun. And then also just thinking about it in the terms of like, how helpful it is for like a lot of people because there's so many people out there that I've come in contact with with the limiting belief of like you know it's too hard to improve my fitness or to get in better shape and for most people most people can walk right and for the people that can walk it's like hey if you can walk start with that and then once you start to build something with that like you know regular gingerly pace like just speed it up right And when we talk about from a longevity standpoint, like way less of an impact on the ankles, knees, hips, right? All the different parts of the body. And then for me, you know, being a a six foot two, you know, 240 pound big black man with with dreads, like I understand it. That looks funny, right? Like I understand that's not what you do. Like you'll get a double take like every time you see that. So, So I realized that it was getting a lot of traction and there was a lot of eyes and comments on it. And then I started to think, what can I do then to create a positive or a strong message while I'm doing it? And that's what I realized along my speed walking journey. And I'll just yes. make so many different metaphors of speed walking and life. And it connects with a lot of people. People get laughed, people get inspired, people go out and start getting their speed walking in. Yeah. And, and for me, it just, it, it just checks so many boxes that I'm like, all right, I'm gonna keep going with this. And I've built like a really big love for it over the last year. And it goes back to your point before, just be you. You're yeah. doing it. And initially there might've been some like, oh, I'm not sure this looks a little goofy or whatever. You're like, I don't give a fuck. I don't right. give a fuck what people think about me. I'm going to do what I want to do. It's, it's healthy. It's, and it's helping people now. It's one of my favorite things. Whenever I <laughs> come across and I need to stop and just fully appreciate it because I need to get to the point where, where I'm not worried about doing something like that because I, I think about myself in that way. Like, would I be able to just go and do what you're doing? I don't know if I have the balls to do that right now, but I'm like, fuck it. Who cares? Right. That's my shit thinking about what other people are thinking about me. And I need to totally right. get rid of that moving forward because I really, you know, it, it really doesn't matter to me. So why would I even worry about it? So we'll do like a, you know, like a joint, like a, like a, I Instagram live where we're both power walking together. I'll, I'll do hey, I'm all for it. I love it. And like you said, it's a great stretch of the comfort zone. Absolutely. We need, and that's where we grow, right? I mean, you could be stuck in this box your whole life and not get out of that comfort zone, but comfort, comfort is slowly killing people. Comfort is killing people in our country and in the world and, yeah. and being able to get out of it, not just in a physical way, but in an emotional, spiritual mental way to get outside of that comfort zone it's it's that's where the growth truly happens and it once you get outside of it you realize all right my comfort zone just grew a little bit because now i'm comfortable with it and you keep challenging yourself and that's where it's once you get to that point it's exponential it just it just happens where you just don't care i'm like i'm gonna keep going and keep going because that's where i know i can inspire other people as well that are stuck in this little bubble and you know we're we're helping them expand that so 
Alvi, thank you so much for being on the Building Men podcast, my man. Where can the, the, the listeners of Building Men find you? How can they reach out to you? How can they watch your speed walking videos? Yeah, for sure. Dan, it's one. Thank you for holding the space and having me on. This was amazing. I really appreciate all the questions and the insights that you sharing yourself with me as well, man. It's super powerful. And everyone, you guys can find me uh, mostly on Instagram at Mr. You Can Too. That's M R Y O U C A N, the number two. I am also on TikTok every once in a while, Mr. You Can Too. And I have a podcast myself called How You Can Too. And you can find that on Spotify, um, what is it, iTunes podcast, and, and most of the different things out there. And I would love that is to have you as a guest on my podcast and really dive more into your story as oh, well. Oh, absolutely. I would I would be honored to do so. And what I will do, Alvi, is I'll put all that information in the show notes. I'll also promote this on Instagram so people will be able to follow along on your journey. Um, so if you're listening to this, go on to Instagram and check out all that Alvi is doing on Mr. You Can Too. To find Building Men is building.men on Instagram. Uh, it's Building Men Podcast on Facebook. We have a YouTube channel up now, so this will also be nice. up on YouTube. Okay. And you can email me, buildingmencoach at gmail.com. Um, I, this was, you are a, um, I put it in quotes, a dynamic human being. I, I'm so blessed to have, to have met you, to have the opportunity to speak to you for a little bit today. I would love now that I know the whole football background um, to do a follow-up with you in a couple months as well, because I have such um, reverence for people that are, um, you know, playing uh, sports at a high level, and just the psychology and the sociology around athletics. I'm intrigued by it. I, I, I could just do a whole podcast just on your experience in sports. So we definitely have to schedule a follow-up interview, and I would be happy to come on to onto your podcast as well. Oh, heck yeah, I would love to do that. And it's funny you talk about the sociology and psychology of it because that's what I studied in college. So it's so fun to see all that stuff circle yeah. back around it and have a lot of value right now for me. And we definitely have that in common. Mine was I did education and sociology were my two, two majors in college. Uh, amazing. I love that. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening to the Building Men podcast. Go a step further than you thought you can go today. We'll see you next time on Building Men.